This week on the Green Left News Podcast, resistance to Israel's genocidal attack on Gaza, the voice referendum fails, and supermarket workers go on a super strike across the country. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist, and today I'm joined by refugee rights activist and Green Left journalist Chloe DS. Welcome. Thanks, Isaac. Good to be here. Hi, listeners. So our feature story this week is, of course, the brutal bombardment of Gaza and the massacre of thousands of Palestinians by Israel following Hamas's latest attack. And at the time of recording, about 4,000 Palestinians have been killed, including more than 1,000 children. And more than 10,000 have been wounded by Israeli strikes. More than a million people have been displaced. And sadly, I'm sure these numbers will have risen by the time you're listening to this. Um, It's hard to fathom the mass destruction and death that Israel is inflicting on Gaza at this time. Hospitals have been bombed. uh, Power, food and water have been cut off. And whole apartment blocks have been turned to rubble. Israel told the whole of northern Gaza, where more than one million people live, to evacuate south, and yet has since been launching strikes against people evacuating. These people have nowhere to run, nowhere to go. Gaza has been occupied by Israel for 56 years and has been under permanent blockade for 16 years. It is using Hamas's latest attack as an excuse to unleash a massive genocidal bombing campaign and another land grab. In the midst of all the horror, it has been inspiring to see people around the world protesting in support of Palestine, including thousands taking to the streets across Australia in most major cities. More than 15,000 people marched in um, Melbourne on October 15th, while more than 5,000 defied New South Wales Premier Chris Minns after he attempted to shut down the gutty Sydney protest on the same day. There has also been a call from Palestinian trades unions for trade unions around the world to take action, including stopping building and transporting weapons to Israel, passing motions in solidarity with Palestine and pressuring the government to end military trade and funding to Israel. Yeah, it's good to see that there's pressure coming from many sectors of society around the world. At Green Left, uh, we've started collecting statements from Asian left groups uh, on Palestine, as well as an open letter from Berzit University in Palestine, uh, which is to international academic institutions. And the Australian Council of Trade Unions has also released a statement calling for an end to the occupation of Palestine. Yeah, of course. And after the rally for uh, the Community Speak Out for Palestine, we organised yesterday, I was walking past the State Library and some of the healthcare workers in Melbourne had organised a big protest on the on the steps of the State Library. Just in 24 hours, they after the bombing of the hospital in Gaza, they decided that they also need to speak out. Um, so it's just good to see spontaneous actions happening all over the place. And it is great to see unions and other organisations standing up for Palestine, the media and some politicians have been trying to slander the pro-Palestine movement as anti-Semitic. But protest organisers have made it clear that anti-Semitism is not tolerated and is not part of the movement to free Palestine. It has been encouraging to see organisations like Jews Against the Occupation and the Zadok Collective play a central role in the protests. The Anthony Albanese government has shamefully fail to condemn Israel's attacks on Palestine, with the PM and Foreign Minister Penny Wong stating that Israel has the right to defend itself. Meanwhile, governments in Europe have cracked down on pro-Palestine protests, including the French government banning them entirely and using water cannons on protesters. The anti-Palestine sentiment in many media outlets, even led to the killing of a six-year-old in the US, who, along with his mother, was stabbed multiple times by their landlord simply for being Palestinian. We must resist all attempts to shut down the democratic right to protest and continue the struggle to end Israel's war and occupation of Gaza. Yeah, and as you mentioned earlier, the New South Wales government had attempted to 
uh, shut down or prevent protests from happening here in Sydney supporting Palestine, as well as uh, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's comments that the protests should not have gone ahead. Uh, in response to that, the New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties has released an open letter calling for the right to protest to be protected. The letter said today's announcement by police that they are blocking another protest and setting up Operation Shelter is deeply concerning. It's another blow to the right to protest which has already been savaged in this state. The organisations that have signed this open letter call on the government to publicly affirm their support for the right to non-violent protest as fundamental to freedom of speech, association and assembly in our state. The letter has been signed by a long list of groups including the NTU New South Wales Division, Amnesty International Australia, the Australian Centre for International Justice, Public Interest Advocacy Centre, Community Legal Centre Australia, Australian Lawyers for Human Rights, uh, the Australian Democracy Network and others. Socialist Alliance Sydney released a statement saying it applauds the open letter and stands with the Palestine Action Group who've been organising the protests here in Gaddi uh, to defend the right to protest and take a stand with the people of Palestine. Uh, the protests that have gone ahead have, have gone ahead without much trouble from police, uh, luckily, and organisers have called follow-up protests that are happening this weekend, although if you're listening, uh, they've probably already happened, unfortunately, so hopefully you were there. Um, but you can find uh, all the details for the upcoming protests for Palestine at the Green Left calendar, which is greenleft.org.au forward slash events, or in the podcast description. I just kind of wanted to just complain about <laughs> the right to protest being taken away from us. I mean, <laughs> like, I mean, we know we've seen the appalling response from Albanese, the Albanese government and the ALP's unwavering support of Israel. And we absolutely condemn that. But when you look, when you just listen to people like Peter Dutton, who basically threatened anyone uh, who attended a Palestine, a, a Palestine rally who is on a temporary visa should be deported. I mean, these are the threats that they're making and scaring people into um, not attending protests. And there was actually one international student that I was trying to get to a protest and she asked me, oh, is it going to be peaceful because I don't, I'm on a student visa and I, I don't want to get deported. And I had to reassure her that it is peaceful. Um, <laughs> it, it's a peaceful demonstration. I mean, these liberal democracies like... Australia and the US, they all pride themselves um, on being democratic. They love to talk about freedom of speech, but look at look at what's happening. They want to stop a democratic process like, you know, our democratic right and freedom to pr protest. Um, it's just, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's, uh, it, it's so frustrating. <laughs> and we do, every, every uh, left-wing person, um, at this moment needs to stand with Palestine right now and we should be taking it to the streets. Yeah, 100%. And um, props to all the organisers of, of protests across the country for, you know, doing their best to ensure that these rallies can go ahead despite attempts to, to block them um, by governments and police. Uh, so, yeah, get to your nearest rally uh, on the Green Left calendar, greenleft.org.au forward slash events. The referendum on the voice to parliament has failed, with the majority voting no to the proposal for an advisory body made of First Nations representatives. Most First Nations people have rightly felt the result as a slap in the face. The modest proposal for token constitutional recognition and a First Nations advisory body was voted down in every state and territory except the ACT. However, nearly all previous constitutional referendums have failed, and the result of this referendum was predicted by all the polls in the lead up to, the, to October 14th. The result should not have been a surprise. The conservative no campaign played to fear, ignorance and entrenched racism from the start. Support for the Yes campaign fell despite a multi-million dollar campaign from many of the largest corporations. The sadness and anger in First Nations communities after the referendum 
which in large majority voted yes, is understandable and deserves respect. But as First Nations Senator Lydia Thorpe said after the referendum, the movement needs to look forward. After the result, she said, to all the grassroots mob activists and allies who have built up networks, yes or no, in the name of advancing the rights of First Peoples, we must look beyond the division that the referendum has caused and come together to demand the justice necessary to rebuild and nurture the strength and power of our communities. Don't agonize, organize should be our catch cry. Uh, More than 200 people attended the National Housing Justice Summit that took place on Sunday, October 8, at the offices of the Maritime Union of Australia in Gaddy and also across the country online and at hookup points in Nam, Mianjin or Brisbane and Corner Yurta or Adelaide. Uh, Construction, Forestry and Maritime and Energy Union National Secretary Zach Smith said that a rich country has to be able to provide a roof over everyone's heads. He asked, how can we say we are a rich nation when governments of all persuasions have waged war on public housing over the last four decades? Federal Greens MP Max chandler Matha, who was another keynote speaker, said that understanding Australia's financialised housing system helps explain Labor's inadequate response to the housing crisis. Dr David Kelly from the from RMIT Centre for Urban Design criticised the Victorian government's plan to demolish 44 public housing towers which we talked about on last week's episode. And Lilia Anderson from the Australia Institute said that big picture solutions such as building public housing are needed now. Ishbel Dunsmore, representing the Sydney Uni SRC, spoke passionately about students not being able to afford rent and public housing tenants and campaigners, Carolyn Yenna, Karen Brown, Margaret Kelly and Kerry Byrne spoke about their respective struggles to stop the demolition of public estates. You can watch videos of the panelists' talks on YouTube by clicking the link in the podcast description. As this year shapes up to be the hottest year on record, a new report from the Climate Council has reaffirmed the need for Australia to reduce carbon emissions by 75% by 2030 and aim for net zero by 2035. Mission Zero, how today's climate choices will reshape Australia, emphasised that the country is not on track to reach this target and that there are grounds to argue for an earlier net zero target date than 2035. Greenleft has previously pointed out that the safeguard mechanism, the government's main climate policy tool, is not even designed to reduce emissions. It does not even ensure that the government's inadequate target can be reached. The Climate Council argues that we need more than targets. We need an action plan that spells out how it will be done. It insists that no new fossil fuel developments should be approved. Meanwhile, Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek has already approved four new coal mines. In response, Move Beyond Coal has been campaigning outside her office and have even put up a billboard that says, What the heck, Plibersek? We voted for climate action, not new coal and gas mines. Yeah, if we want real action on climate, we need a mass climate movement. And that's what Rising Tide is trying to build with its upcoming people's blockade of the world's largest coal port in Mullumbimba or Newcastle. In preparation for the blockade, Rising Tide held a forum at Newcastle Town Hall on October 9, which drew hundreds of attendees to discuss why fossil fuel projects should not be approved. Speakers addressed the changing climate records, discussing the significantly larger and unprecedented margins. And Rising Tide organiser Alexis Stewart said that the gobsmacking rate of fossil fuel approvals is impossible to accept. 740 projects have been approved since the year 2000. Stewart urged people to attend the blockade from November 24 to 27 to create massive non-linear resistance to force Parliament to act. One of the biggest challenges facing the climate movement today is the anti-protest laws that have been introduced in many states. One activist who found himself at the mercy of these draconian laws is Jay La Ballastia, who, who was arrested for gluing himself to the Sydney Harbour Bridge as part of a fireproof Australia protest in April last year. La Ballastia spent four days in custody, spent 42 days under a community control order, 
served 200 hours of community service and was fined $7,025. But on October 4th, he was resentenced after it was found that police had provided false information in his original trial. Police had claimed that the protest had stopped an ambulance from crossing the bridge, but this was not true. These lies meant that La Ballastia was more harshly sentenced. Police across the country are continuing to target protesters with WA police recently demanding that journalists working from the ABC's Four Corners hand over footage of protesters. La Ballastia said he is hopeful that the climate movement is building momentum. He said... I sense things are starting to shift. Momentum is building again. To secure a livable planet, we will depend on our ability to build a mass movement and to employ a diversity of non-violent tactics. It's important that the right to protest is protected, just as it's important that whistleblowers are protected. Back in September, a cross-party delegation of Australian politicians visited the United States to lobby for an end to the U.S.'s attempts to extradite WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Prior to the trip, more than 60 parliamentarians from across the political spectrum publicly declared that the prosecution and incarceration of the Australian citizen Julian Assange must end. Rain Sinclair from the Melbourne for Assange campaign told Green Left that it seems the campaign to free Assange has reached a tipping point. She said this delegation of six politicians represents the entire political spectrum and have vastly different views. However, they all oppose the persecution of Julian Assange and want him brought home, she said. Many would have breathed a sigh of relief when media magnate Rupert Murdoch finally retired in late September. But it is unlikely there will be any positive change to his massive media empire. The Murdochs have had a very heavy hand in defining freedom of speech in a neoliberal, right-wing, libertarian, tabloid journalism, shock jock, angertainment, media landscape. Throughout Rupert Murdoch's career, there have been countless scandals, including the phone hacking scandal in London, his support for US President Donald Trump, cheering on Margaret Thatcher's smashing of the miners' union, sacking thousands of journalists and newspaper staff, and enabling all manner of right-wing atrocities. Members of the Retail and Fast Food Workers Union, or RAFWU, at hundreds of Coles and Woolies supermarkets took part in a historic nationwide super strike on October 7 as they escalated industrial action for a living wage and better working conditions. About a thousand workers across the country walked off the job from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., after the supermarket giants refused to budge on Rafwu's demands for higher wages, safer workplaces, and secure jobs. This is the first time that supermarket workers have taken nationwide industrial action, and Rafwu Secretary Josh Cullinan told Channel 9 that Woolworths and Coles are yet to make a single offer on a single item a year after bargaining started, and that workers are so fed up with what's been going on for a year since they started bargaining in December. Meanwhile, Coles and Woolies have made huge profits during the cost of living crisis, $1.1 billion and $1.6 billion respectively. Both companies have used inflation as an excuse to jack up prices while wages have stagnated. Rafu has set up a fund to support striking workers, which you can donate to at chuffed.org slash project slash superstrike. And you can also listen to the interview I did with Josh Cullinan, the Rafu National Secretary, uh, which is available on the podcast feed. Yeah, and we also interviewed Josh Cullinan from Rafu on Green Left Radio last week. So you can check out our radio podcast uh, on the 3CR webpage. Now on to uh, the Centrelink Workers Strike, Federal Public Service Workers in Services Australia, which includes Centrelink workers, went on strike for 24 hours on October 9th in support of their claim for an improved pay offer from the federal Labor government. Community and Public Sector Union National Secretary Melissa Donnelly said the Albanese Labor government made a commitment to the public service to become a model employer and to rebuild the Australian public service after a decade of damage and destruction. The union said there is strong support for the negotiated conditions package, which includes working from home rights, more paid parental leave, 
the reintroduction of job security provisions and greater casual loading rates. But it said workers are feeling extreme cost of living pressures and the current pay offer is inadequate. The principle of one person, one vote took a big leap forward in the city of Sydney last week with the abolition of double votes for businesses. In 2014, then New South Wales Coalition Premier Mike Baird introduced a law to give businesses two votes each in a move that was widely seen as an attempt to get rid of Mayor Clover Moore and deliver control of the City of Sydney Council to business interests. And this anti-democratic move was protested strongly at the time uh, and resentment lingered throughout all the subsequent council elections with campaigners uh, maintaining the pressure for it to be abolished ever since. And now the double votes have been abolished. Campaigners are pushing for an end to non-resident voting completely, which is something that has been achieved in Queensland and Britain. And now let's hear what is happening around the world. Obviously, the big story this week has been what's happening in Palestine, but another example of a powerful country bombing civilians is Turkey's attacks on northeast Syria, which is also known as Rojava. And these attacks escalated on October 5, following comments by Turkey's foreign minister the day before, after suicide attacks in Ankara. In the comments, he stated that all infrastructure and energy facilities operated by the Kurdistan Workers' Party and People's Protection Units in Iraq and Syria were legitimate targets for security forces. The internationalist commune of Rojava told Green Left that these are the most significant military attacks in the region in a long time. It said, the Turkish fascist state is bombing cities all over the region with drones, fighter jets and artillery, and the main targets of the bombings are civilian infrastructure, such as power stations, oil facilities, construction sites, etc. As a result of the attacks, many civilians lost their lives and many got heavily injured. Yeah, um, solidarity with with the the Kurdish struggle. In India, the Narendra Modi regime has cracked down on independent media platform NewsClick, launching a massive police raid on October third and arrest almost fifty journalists. The police used new anti terror laws, which give them powers to arrest people without evidence. The Modi government used the excuse that NewsClick was receiving money from Chinese sources. But in reality, it is an attack on press freedom, trying to shut down a media platform known for being critical of the government. The government had used a New York Times report to back their claims of the connection to China. Amnesty International said the raids were the latest attempts by the Indian government to decimate independent and critical media. The Communist Party of India Marxist-Leninist Liberation called the raids an open reflection of the unbridled emergency the country is facing. Protests were held across the country by left-wing and human rights groups with prominent author and activist Arundhati Roy speaking at one rally. Days later, Roy is being prosecuted for a speech she made in 2010 advocating for the succession of Kashmir from India. As the CPIML Liberation said, the Modi BJP regime is hell-bent on suppressing every voice that agrees with it, expresses dissent, and speaks truth to power. On the topic of Kashmir, as you mentioned, um, there's an anti-neoliberal movement that's going on in the Pakistani-administered part of the region. According to Pakistani leftists uh, Farooq Saleria and Harris Qadir, the movement has been blacked out by the Pakistani media despite it being in its fifth month and achieving mass power on October 5, when a general strike took place across the region. Also, for the second month in a row, the majority of people in major towns are refusing to pay their electricity bills, and the combination of these strikes, refusing to pay bills, and peaceful mass protests is unnerving the Pakistani-administered Jammu and Kashmir government, which rules the region from Pakistan's capital of Islamabad. The movement started in May in reaction to spiralling electricity prices 
and demands to restore a subsidy on wheat prices. The left are playing an instrumental role in the movement, which is led by an alliance of Marxist groups and secular nationalists, and police are hunting down People's Action Committee leaders who have gone underground. Simultaneously, though, the police are hesitant to detain activists because the police stations where activists are detained are being besieged by unarmed agitators. That sounds like a powerful movement there. While we were discussing Pakistan, we have a great interview with Pakistani socialist Amr Ali Jan on the impact of growing US-China tension on Pakistan and implications for anti-imperialism in the global south. Hakuk e Kalk. Okay. All right. Ali Jan is General Secretary of the anti capitalist Hakuk e Kalk Party in Pakistan. You can find the interview on greenleft.org.au as well as a longer version at links.org.au. Another great interview you can find at Links International Journal of Socialist Renewal and on Green Left is with Akira Kato from the Japanese Revolutionary Communist League. A revolutionary Marxist faction, uh, about the rising military tensions in the region, with the Japanese government ramping up military spending and strengthening mil- military ties with Australia and the US. So check both of those interviews out. On the topic of Japan, thousands protested around the world against its dumping of nuclear waste from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean ahead of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Summit on September 18 to 19. Protests in 16 cities across eight countries call for an end to the dumping. The New York rally delivered the Global People's Joint Statement, signed by more than 2.1 million people around the world to the UN. And on and just on that, there is a, here in Melbourne, I'm not sure about, I think in Sydney as well, and around Australia, the Korean community are protesting against the Fukushima nuclear power plant and against the Japanese government and against their own government, against the, the Korean government as well. They're saying, I mean, it, it is affecting the people of Korea. They're uh, fishing industries, that you know, their food, uh, their lives are at risk. And um, shout out to the Korean comrades who are demonstrating outside the Japanese consulate on Burke Street. I encourage people to get down and support them. They're they're out there at least once every few weeks, um, and yeah, and show show a bit of solidarity because yeah, um, a lot of the neighboring countries are being affected. All the all the peoples in the neighboring countries are all being affected by this. Yeah, it's an important international uh, movement against the uh, dumping of nuclear waste. Uh, Meanwhile, in Germany, um, Berlin's grassroots housing movement launched a new campaign on September 26 for a legally binding referendum to expropriate housing from for-profit corporate landlords. The launch date marked exactly two years since the previous uh, successful but non-binding housing referendum in which 59% of Berliners voted to expropriate corporate landlords that own 3,000 apartments or more. If successful, the new proposal would enact a law mandating the buyback and socialization of 243,000 rental properties. And Carol Peterson, who's been active in the Right to the City, uh, English language working group of the campaign, since 2020, told Green Left that at the time of the first referendum, it was too soon to get the wording of the law right. Um, And the backdrop to the campaign in Berlin is Berlin's worsening housing crisis, with rents rising by 27% this year, making it the second most expensive city in the country, which is having an immense impact on a city where 85% of people are renters. Just six companies own 11% of the apartments in Berlin, and speculation on housing has driven up rents while delivering huge profits for corporate landlords. So we'll be closely following this campaign and perhaps it can provide inspiration for housing activists in Australia. You can read more about all of the stories we talked about today, plus videos, detailed analysis and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au.
As we mentioned at the top of the podcast, the protests will continue across the country in solidarity with Palestine. Uh, and you can go to greenleft.org.au forward slash events to find your nearest rally, as well as other activist events, forums and protests across the country. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can become a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. Your support is really appreciated. And a special shout out and thanks to our podcast editor, Sean Valenzuela or Little Archer Beats, who is now editing this podcast from Japan. Um, so huge thanks to Sean for all his help with this podcast project. You can remember to follow Green Left on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Yeah, Sean edits out all our sneezes and coughs and all our mistakes. So if we sound per- to a bit too perfect, it's it's because of Sean. You can blame Sean. <laughs> thanks for listening. Thanks, listeners. Thanks, Isaac. 